Good evening everyone. Thank you all for joining us today in our exclusive event for real estate key stakeholders. We are very, very pleased to have you here uh, with us this evening as we cap off the year by hearing all about the outlook for our industry. Now, to start things off, is one of the most respected business speakers in the country, Mr. Francis Kong, who will provide the opening remarks for today's event. As I'm sure many of you know, Mr. Francis Kong has taken part in numerous local and international conferences and is well known for his discussions on leadership. He is also a businessman, business consultant and acclaimed author. So without further ado, let's all listen to Mr. Kong. Hello, Francis Kong here. And Prime Philippines, thank you for creating this gathering for the key industry leaders and this is such an important occasion because as leaders, you and I are facing a very unique situation. And by the leadership that we show, it is crucial as we bring our people to understand two important things I want to share with you. COVID-19 is going to pass. This is not the end of the world. And COVID-19 is not a dead end, it is a detour. Therefore, you and I, as leaders, we would understand that it is crucial and it is important for us to model hope. Leaders are merchants of hope, as Winston Churchill would say. We have to make our people understand that this is a very uncomfortable situation as life always would be. Life is always a combination of trials and tragedies and triumphs as well. And this happens to be a very uncomfortable situation we are in, but hope is in the new improvement and recovery is in the horizon. You know, you have the vaccine there, the, the economy is slowly opening up, and we are just hoping that at a very early time and age, we shall gain back what we have lost, and we shall not only do that. The idea here is to understand that we don't just survive this situation, but we have to fight. And we have to put ourselves in readiness to explore and explore the opportunities that will come. That's the job of leaders. We need to infuse hope that is based on realistic happening and expectation. And the second thing I want to share with you now is you need to take good care of yourself. You need to be strong. You need to be healthy. And uh, this is not the time to lower your guards. This is not the time for us to feel as if everything is already normal because it is not. 
vaccines are different from vaccinations. It will still take time before we have it. And secondly, while this pandemic has brought in turbulence, this pandemic will pass. But the turbulence will still be here with us to stay. That's why you got to take care of yourself. You are leaders, but you're not Marvel or DC superheroes. So you got to make sure that you make yourself strong. You make yourself healthy because you need to you need to lend your strength to a lot of our people who would need it. And that's why history is in the making. And you and I are part of the writing of history. And so as leaders, I want to share with you this wish of mine, which is the narrative that we are making right now, the stories we are telling, will form the legacy that we're going to be leaving our people and our children behind. So we got to make sure that this is a good story we are writing about, a story that is filled with hope, a story that understands while the situation may be very difficult, but God is still in control. And I've, we've read through scriptures, we understand. Nowhere in scriptures will you ever find God saying, oops, I made a mistake. And uh, we hold on to the promise that all things work out to the good for those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. And so things are going to get better. Meanwhile, we have to go through the difficulty of this strange situation now, but we lead our people from where we are to the opportunities that await us. And so, well, celebrate your time together, learn from one another. And I'm sure that this is the best time for us to always also remember Merry Christmas. While we are going to experience a different Christmas, but the real message of Christmas will always remain the same. It doesn't change. While we are changing the methods of doing things, our mission will still be the same. So, enjoy your day together and a blessed Christmas to one and all. God bless you. Wow, some um, really fantastic words for us all to think about there from Mr. Francis Kong. Um, thank you so much to him for sending us. So, we will start with the program. And we'll start with an overview of our economy and the general outlook for the country, as well as the real estate sector in particular. Our next speaker is from the National Economic and Development Authority and currently serves as the Under Secretary for Policy and Planning. Our esteemed speaker holds a PhD in Economics from La Trobe University in Australia and a Master's degree in Economics and Statistics from the University of the Philippines. Prior to her work in NEDA, she was the Executive Director of the Asia Pacific Policy Center, a firm focused on development policy research. She has worked in various fields of specialization in economics, including agriculture, agrarian reform, labor, project development, social capital, growth theory, and global business. So, over to you, Under Secretary Rosemary Adila. Thank you. Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for uh, including the NEDA to this uh, to this event of yours. And thank you so much that even under the nor the new normal, you have decided to uh, uh, bring together this uh, this event. Uh, like uh, what Francis Francis Kong has said, uh, this is not the end. COVID nineteen is not the end. It's just a detour. And so we really need to uh, uh, you know the the easy the the quicker we uh, get uh, back on our feet, then uh, the better it will be for all of us. Um, if I may share my screen with you, please. Okay. Uh, I just would like to confirm that you're able to see my screen. Yes? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay, so uh, I'll proceed. Uh, I'll be very quick in discussing with you the, the pre-COVID economic performance and then the impact of COVID because uh, I would like to uh, be able to uh, uh, have some more time in uh, discussing the lessons uh, we have learned from this COVID so far and uh, as they relate to the real estate sector and then of course the economic outlook. So pre-COVID, Philippines actually entered 2020 with a very strong position. So in fact, uh, our economic growth was very, very strong, averaging 6.6% on average 
from uh, uh, 2016 to 2019. We were supposed to be an upper middle income country this year, were it not for COVID. We have originally targeted uh, 2022, actually, as the year when we graduate to becoming an upper middle income country. But looking at our performance, we have already kind of expected that we will be uh, uh, we will have that, uh, you know, that graduation to upper middle income country by this year. But of course, there's COVID, and then there's also the other uh, indicators like uh, the inflation was okay. We have strong fiscal position, our infrastructure uh, project. We have our program, our credit rating. Of course, uh, it's the the highest it's been. Uh, we have had the lowest unemployment rate and the uh, underemployment rate and also the lowest poverty incidence so far. So we were doing great in terms of the economic indicators and in terms of the social indicators. But of course, COVID came. And right now, this is the latest I have as of uh, uh, December 15. Uh, confirmed cases is at 451,839, but the active number of cases is just 24,000. Uh, 088 and take note that many of this uh, 24,000 and uh, to be exact uh, almost 23,000 22,000 of them are actually mild and asymptomatic and uh, so far of this uh, 451,000 cases only 32,370 have been ab admitted to the hospital meaning these are the ones who are critical and severe uh, with respect to the NCR, we're actually doing uh, much, much better and I hope it stays that way even during the holidays. Um, active number of cases is 7,538 uh, and then uh, again, you have uh, more than 6,000 of those are actually the mild and asymptomatic cases. Now, this uh, is actually the more important uh, uh, curve to, to look at that uh, right now, December 16, if you go to the uh, rightmost portion of this curve and uh, look here at the seven day moving average, it says here it's 1,267. So we are getting 1,267 new cases a day. Uh, we still want that uh, much, much lower, of course. But then compare that to what we were, where we were, let's say in August, where it was almost at uh, 7,000 a day. So that was really when our hospital capacity was being overwhelmed. Then apart from that, we have the daily positivity rate. It's now at 4.2%. Actually, it's been below four per, below five percent which is the benchmark set by uh uh by by the who and we have been um in that territory for like uh about two weeks now uh again there's the holidays uh there's still uh, a lot that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty here but i think by and large we are learning how to manage this uh COVID-19 pandemic. Another piece of good news is that with respect to health capacity utilization rate, uh, we only have, uh, well, we have two actually, uh, three. Three regions that are in the warning zone. You have Davao in the danger zone with respect to the ICU bed capacity and then the car. Uh, I think with respect to uh, to Davao, it's really a case that they don't have much of, of the ICU beds. And so the uh, solution here is really to increase that ICU beds. As for the others, and most especially NCR, we are actually, uh, uh, we're, we, we, we could say that we're actually uh, safe. Um, we are, we're nowhere near capacity. Now, those uh, those numbers with respect to managing the COVID-19 actually came at a very high cost, as in literally a high cost. So our quarter or three quarters economic growth has actually contracted by 10 percent. And this is the lowest that we've had ever, ever since. And uh, as you can see here, I have here the breakdown of the sectoral performance. Uh, in particular, we are interested in this uh, household final consumption expenditure, which contracted by 8.2% during the first three quarters of the year. Now, this is important because this is about three quarters of the GDP. So if this contracts by a whole lot, then you expect that the GDP will really contract. Uh, most, other, uh, most other sectors actually contracted as well, except for government final consumption expenditure. And this is also by design. We were uh, uh, we were implementing what you call uh, the counter-cyclical fiscal policy. 
Now, if we look at the uh, uh, the subsectors of this household final consumption expenditure, then you see some bright spots here. Then uh, I have uh, actually shaded here all those uh, expenditure items where we are seeing a quarter on quarter growth. But of course, you know, if you look at the year on year, then it would still be negative. But you can see here that some of those uh, uh, expenditure items like alcohol, beverages and tobacco, clothing and footwear, furnishings, household equipment and routine household maintenance. These are actually uh, improving in terms of a quarter on quarter basis. And this is very important because these are what we call the non-essential uh expend spending items meaning that uh we as we say we're on the mend we're not there yet but uh clearly we we see that uh, if we're able to reopen the economy safely then the economic recovery it's really the the most effective way of uh, uh of economic recovery on the production side again as you see here uh again a minus 10 percent for gdp and then agriculture was the only sector that uh, posted a positive, uh, positive growth rate. Industry was minus 14.3, services was a minus 9.5. But again, if you look at the different subsectors of this uh, of these services, then again there are bright spots, bright bright spots here. You have the uh, ICT. Okay, uh, actually posting a positive performance. Public administration and defense, that's actually uh, government also being positive. Uh, and then you have all the others, again, the shaded uh, subsectors that exhibit a quarter on quarter improvement. And I might just add here that uh, uh, real estate and ownership of dwellings is actually showing improvement on a quarter on quarter basis not yet on a year on year. We actually expect that uh, um, we will be able to recover to our pre-COVID uh, pand pandemic levels probably by uh, late 2021 or early 2022. So we really need to transition to this new normal. It's a new re reality that we have to face. But first, let's look at the lessons that we have learned. First of all, we have seen once again how informal settlers are really disadvantaged, especially in this COVID-19. We see that population living in informal settlements in urban areas are actually more vulnerable to COVID-19. Given the difficulty to observe social distancing, they have inadequate access to household water, which is also, which is also a prerequisite at this uh, particular time. And these are just some of the statistics. And this is just for Metro Manila, where you have 3.8 million people living in housing units that are under 20 square meters, okay, or only 4.25 square meters per person. So uh, not really the ideal situation for doing social distancing. Other lessons amplified is really the need for access to water, sanitation, and health facilities, adequate housing in well-planned communities, preferably where residents live near the places of work. So it's really about estate planning and not just, just about constructing houses. Uh, there's the need for uh, access to efficient public transport system and then the fast and reliable internet connection. We think that working from home is here to stay and therefore uh, all housing projects for that matter will need to consider this. We have already updated the Philippine Development Plan and uh, we have actually uh, revised the desired outcome. It's now towards a healthy and resilient Philippines. And we have actually tweaked the different strategies in that PDP so that it will make for being a healthy and resilient Philippines. And we have included actually for uh, the, uh, the, the, um, um, the chapter that is uh, relevant to the real estate is this one. It is chapter 12, uh, build safe, resilient and sustainable communities where actually we will now be including all those uh, you know, policies uh, and even regulations that make for a resilient uh, settlements and communities. Water security has to be there, okay? 
and then uh, we will make sure that there will be you know those building and design standards will now consider also public health goal goals where you have proper ventilation should be there where there is ample uh, social distancing can be done and then you have this uh, uh, green uh, spaces and the open spaces so we also need to streamline the management of healthcare and infectious wastes. And uh, we are actually uh, seeing that this could be a problem uh, going forward. And therefore, again, in terms of uh, the real estate, we're hoping that uh, this would also be included in terms of the, of the planning that uh, we, we don't want another zoonotic disease, uh, you know, in our midst later on. And like I said, we're starting to recover. We're beginning to see signs of that. And I just want to, uh, uh, this is my second to the last slide, and I just want to uh, share with you that yes, for 2020, we are expecting a contraction of the economy, as would uh, most countries in the, in, in, in the world. Uh, in 2021, we are expecting a positive uh, growth rate, 6.5 to 7.5%. But this means that uh, if we do contract by 8.5 to 9.5%, then we will not be able to reach our pre-COVID-19 levels by 2021, but we do expect a very huge bounce back by 2022, growing by 8 to 10%. And let me just end with this one. This is actually the long-term vision of Filipinos, the Ambition Nat in 2040, where uh, this is based on a survey we did uh, back in 2016. And uh, it turns out that Filipinos want to be able to enjoy strong family and community ties, matatag, maginhawa, comfortable lifestyle, and a secure future, panatag. And yes, having secure ownership is part of the ambition. And right now, it's really about having secure, safe, and resilient home ownership. So I hope that uh, that factors into your, your planning processes and even in the implementation of your different programs. So good evening once again, and thank you very much for your attention. Our next speaker is a representative from the Banco Central Nag Filipinas and will be giving us an overview of direction for financial and monetary policy. As we know, BSP takes charge of matters such as monetary policy and operations, risk management, financial supervision, and currency management. So, it is only right that as a sector heavily reliant on capital and the financial sector to all listen in as our central bank gives us their overview and outlook for the country and our industry. Officers and staff of Prime Philippines, business leaders, and distinguished guests. A pleasant evening. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this webinar event. Allow me to share with you the recent economic developments in our country and why we see some green shoots of hope while we are still in the midst of the pandemic. These are partly due to policy measures implemented by the BSP to support the economy. Then, I will discuss the importance of the real estate sector, its recent performance, and some measures that provide support to the sector. I will end with the latest macroeconomic assumptions of the government and some key takeaways. We are all aware of the unprecedented situation we are all in now, brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. The Philippine economy contracted by 10% in the first three quarters of the year, following 21 years of uninterrupted growth. The unemployment rate also shot up to 11% for the same period, after it was recorded below 6% in the past four years. Looking at the third quarter performance, however, some improvements have been observed reflecting the return of economic activities as the quarantine was eased. Netting out seasonality, the Philippine economy grew by 8% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis after two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Technically, 
this could mean that the country is starting to recover from a recession. This is also reflected in the improvement in the country's unemployment rate, which declined further to 8.7% in the last quarter of the year, after posting double-digit rates of 17.6% and 10% in the second and third quarters of 2020, respectively. While domestic economic activity is starting to improve, our headline inflation remains within the government's target range for the year, averaging 2.6% from January to November 2020. Inflation is expected to remain manageable and settle within the government's target range of 2 to 4% for the year. The country's benign inflation helps mitigate the downside risks to growth and boost market confidence. Even with the sizable financing requirements to mitigate the effects of the pandemic, our economy's debt profile remains manageable. While the Philippines' debt-to-GDP ratio increased to 46.8% as of end September 2020, this remains way below the debt-to-GDP ratio that was recorded by the country during the fiscal crisis in 2004, which was at 72%. Also, the country's total external debt increased only to 25.3% of GDP as of end September 2020. The ratio indicates that the country's external debt management has remained prudent and sustainable with strong position to service foreign borrowings in the medium to long term. The country's external debt to GDP ratio remains one of the lowest as compared to other ASEAN member countries. The level of our gross international reserves also represents adequate external liquidity buffer based on international benchmarks. Amidst the COVID-19 crisis, the Philippine peso has remained stable and has been one of the strongest currencies in the region. The strength of the Philippine peso, even during the period of pandemic, is reflective of continued financial markets confidence on the Philippine economy. Weak FX demand for current account transactions such as payments for goods and services imports as well as surplus position in the balance of payments. Moreover, despite the challenges faced by our banking system, it remains resilient. The non-performing loan ratio of the Philippine banking system remains manageable at 3.7% as of end October 2020. To put things in perspective, the NPL ratio during Asian financial crisis were in double-digit levels. Banks also remain well capitalized with capital adequacy ratios above the BSP regulatory requirement of 10% and Bank for International Settlements standard of 8%. At the outset of the pandemic, the swift and decisive measures undertaken by the BSP have provided crucial support to the economy and restored market confidence. The BSP implemented a number of policy measures ranging from the usual liquidity enhancing and regulatory relief measures to extraordinary measures. The policy rate was reduced by a cumulative 200 basis points. Reserve requirements were reduced by 200 basis points for universal and commercial banks and by 100 basis points each for thrift banks and rural and cooperative banks. The BSP entered into a 300 billion peso repurchase agreement with the national government through the Bureau of the Treasury 
which was repaid in September 2020. A fresh provisional advances of 540 billion pesos payable by end December 2020 was extended to the national government. We also opened a daily one-hour window to purchase government securities in the secondary market. We remitted dividends amounting to 20 billion pesos to support the national government programs even if the VSP is no longer required under our new charter to remit cash dividends to the national government. Moreover, we expanded the set of eligible instruments as compliance with the BSP's reserve requirement to include newly granted loans to micro, small, and medium enterprises and critically impacted large enterprises that do not belong to a conglomerate structure. The BSP also took a proactive stance in its prudential actions. It issued time-bound and targeted regulatory and operational relief measures to encourage BSP-supervised financial institutions to continue their support to the economy, with particular emphasis on the MSME sector. These measures include extension of financial relief to borrowers, incentivized lending, promotion of continued access to financial services, support for continued financial services delivery, and support for sufficient level of domestic liquidity and economic activity. In August 2020, the BSP amended the rules on real estate loan limits of universal and commercial banks and thrift banks in order to support growth in productive sectors of the economy amid the pandemic, including real estate activities. The easing of the real estate loan limit of universal and commercial banks from 20% to 25% also aims to encourage bank lending to households for the acquisition or construction of a residential real estate property. However, to ensure financial stability, universal commercial banks and their subsidiary thrift banks are also required to comply with the real estate stress test rest limits after assuming a 25% write-off of real estate exposures. Under the new guidelines, the methodology for computing a bank's rest limits was revised to exclude residential real estate loans to individuals for own occupancy and foreclosed real estate property. The rest limits are implemented as soft limits such that a bank may maintain exposures to real estate for as long as it is able to demonstrate ability to manage risks. This ensures that a holistic approach is adopted by banks in the management of their risks vis-a-vis their capital position. Meanwhile, the recently enacted Bayanihan Law contains a provision that authorizes the President to direct the covered institutions, which include real estate developers, to implement a one-time 60-day grace period for the payment of all loans falling due on or before December 31, 2020, thereby effectively extending the maturity of said loans. The law also has a provision on regulatory reliefs for financial institutions that agree to further loan term extensions or restructuring as may be determined by the BSP, which may include exemption from the limits on real estate loans when applicable. 
Moreover, as part of the ongoing effort to develop a more comprehensive or holistic measure of real property prices in the country, the BSP issued Circular Number 1102 requiring banks to submit quarterly report on appraised commercial property to be used for price monitoring and commercial real estate. The QRACP will be the groundwork to generate a new commercial property price index or CPPI to complement the existing residential real estate price index. The BSP will publish and disseminate the inaugural publication of the CCPI via the website in June 2021. Why is real estate sector an area of interest? While the real estate industry is not under the regulatory purview of the BSP, it is viewed as an important concern in the BSP's conduct of monetary policy and financial supervision for the following reasons. 1. Asset prices affect volatility in general price levels and economic output. Also, volatility in asset prices which could be brought about by undue speculation or bubbles may give rise to widespread financial instability. In the past, real estate boom is primarily financed by bank lending and real estate is the most credit intensive good, albeit one of the most illiquid assets of financial institutions. Moreover, the central bank has a mutual relationship with the real estate sector since the BSP's policy actions also affect the movements and behavior in the property market. For example, a hike in policy rates lowers the value of asset holdings of individuals and financial institutions. It could potentially make credit financing more costly for both buyers and property suppliers, effectively containing the property market boom. The real estate sector and property markets play a vital role in supporting the economic growth momentum of the Philippines in two respects. First, the housing sector fulfills the fundamental need for adequate and safe housing for the Filipino people. Housing affects the decision-making of households as rents and or mortgage form part of their consumption and investment choices. Second, the housing market is also an important driver of economic growth. The boom in construction provides employment opportunities for skilled laborers as well as demand in property-related sectors such as industrial cement and steel manufacturing and the retail sector. Despite the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, we see some positive developments in the Philippine real estate industry. It appears that the real estate market continues to be supported by firm structural dynamics. One positive development is the appreciation of property prices in the first half of 2020 based on Residential Real Estate Price Index or RERP. RERP rose by 27.1% year-on-year in Q2 2020, the highest year-on-year -year growth rate recorded since the start of the series in Q1 2016. The possible reasons cited by the banks for this increase include higher demand for high-end projects which drove the average price per square meter upwards and rising prices of construction materials, labor costs, and other indirect costs. Example, higher marketing costs of appraised premium properties. 
It is worth noting, however, that capital values for office and residential units in the country's major commercial and business districts decreased during the period due to lesser demand amid the pandemic. A higher vacancy rate is also expected for 2020 due mainly to slowdown in leasing activities, weak demand, and a cautious market. Another positive development is the continued positive growth in bank lending to real estate activities. Amid the pandemic, the financial system has continued to support real estate development by providing funds to property developers as well as to households for the purchase of homes. This performance could possibly benefited from the implemented easing of real estate loan limits that I previously discussed. As shown in the upper left hand chart, blue bar, loans to the real estate sector represented a sizable proportion of bank lending. Real estate activities is the major contributor to growth of production loans to the Philippine banking system as of end October 2020. Banks have also invested in debt and equity securities, although at smaller magnitude, the proceeds of which are used to finance real estate activities. Nonetheless, the ratio of overall non-performing real estate loans to total real estate loans has been low, 1.7% as of end December 2019, showing that banks have remained prudent in their assessment of real estate loans. According to market analysts, real estate sector will start improving in the second half of 2021 as consumer and business confidence rebound with easing of lockdown measures and optimism over the vaccine distribution. Drivers of real estate in the country include offshore companies and outsourcing from China. The Philippines is a more affordable and lucrative market for foreign companies due to its big English-speaking workforce. There is an increased demand from global e-commerce companies, call centers, and gaming firms, among others. Continuous supply of flexible workspace. Flexible space operators like WeWork and IWG have extended their footprint in the country. More local providers of co-working and co-living spaces are also expected to emerge typically operating in fringe areas. The lower capital costs in these types of assets are also seen to spark investor interest. Colliers believes that the flexible workspace area will expand by 10% at a minimum in the coming three years. Co-working spaces will not only cater to small companies and digital nomads, but also to multinational and outsourcing companies that look for flexibility. Logistics is another asset type that is expected to grow. The emergence of e-commerce firms will support logistics sector as shipment and transportation of merchandise will be needed. Lazada and Salora, for example, have greatly expanded their operations in the Philippines that will benefit the logistics sector. Increased amount of Chinese buyers. According to Bloomberg, the gambling gaming market has attracted around 100,000 Chinese workers to the Metro Manila area since September 2016. Higher remittances from overseas. Philippines is the third largest recipient of foreign remittances in the world. Overseas Filipino remittances finance the purchase of homes and investments in real estates of OFs and their families based on the Q4 2020 BSP Consumer Expectation Survey. About 5% of the OFW households surveyed indicated that they use remittances for the purchase of a house. OF remittances 
have been improving in recent months, with data for the first 10 months of the year showing a much reduced contraction of 0.9% from double-digit declines during the height of the pandemic and lockdown in April and May 2020. Latest projection of OF remittances indicate a decline of only 2% this year from 5% forecast earlier and a recovery of 4% growth in 2021. However, market analysts also identified potential risks to real estate industry. One is the ongoing tax reform that may invite scrutiny on the competitiveness of the Philippines as an attractive foreign investment destination. While the global economy is coming back, the ascent will likely be long, uneven, and uncertain. Recovery is not assured while the pandemic continues to spread, with renewed upticks in COVID-19 infections in places that had reduced local transmission to low levels, reopenings have paused, and targeted shutdowns are being reinstated. Economies everywhere face difficult paths back to pre-pandemic activity levels. Pogo, relying on overseas demand for online gaming may be subject to disruption if foreign governments begin regulating the players and facilities or even restricting capital flows into this business. More directly, if the large number of foreign workers in Pogo and other sectors are prohibited from working in the Philippines, then the residential property market would lose a significant pool of clients. Moving forward, the PSP will carefully and proactively manage the risks that would affect price stability and financial stability. After contracting by 10% in the first three quarters of 2020, the Philippine economy is seen to improve further in the last quarter as it is projected to have a negative growth of 9.5 to 8.5% for the full year. As domestic restrictions are slowly lifted and economic sectors gradually reopen, our economy is projected to recover strongly by 6.5 to 7.5% in 2021 and 8 to 10% in 2022. Inflation is expected to remain manageable and settle within the government's target range of 2 to 4% from 2020 and 2022. The average inflation rate for this year is projected to range from 2.4 to 2.6%, while the inflation assumption for 2021 and 2022 is retained at 2 to 4%. In line with recent trends in global trade, the growth assumption for goods exports is maintained at negative 16% for 2020, while growth of goods imports for 2020 was further adjusted to negative 20%. These are expected to pick up by 2021 and 2022, with the growth of goods exports maintained at 5% and growth of goods imports pegged at 8%. Meanwhile, the national government deficit to GDP ratio is programmed from 7.6% this year to 8.9% in 2021 and 7.3% in 2022. This balances the requirement of supporting economic recovery while keeping the debt to GDP ratio within a sustainable threshold. The government intends to maintain prudence in fiscal management, recognizing the importance of keeping the country in a good fiscal position. In closing, I would like to highlight that the Philippine economy's narrative anchors on a dynamic track record of a resilient and sustainable economic growth. Indeed, we have been through difficult times and we continue to be in a challenging environment 
as our economy is moving towards recovery. The current pandemic has underscored the BSP's central role as an agent of macroeconomic stability during periods of crisis. The BSP undertook unprecedented measures to ensure liquidity in the financial markets and provide support to the real economy without losing focus on its primary mandates of safeguarding price and financial stability. This is true particularly with the implementation of measures related to the real estate sector. The real estate sector is an important concern in the BSP's conduct of monetary policy and financial supervision. The sector performed positively amid pandemic and has drivers and potential risks to growth. Moving forward, the BSP will remain watchful and vigilant, utilizing its analytical and surveillance tools for any potential risks to its monetary and financial stability objectives. As what BSP Governor Benjamin Jokno constantly declares, rest assured that the BSP is firmly committed within its mandate to help the Philippine economy recover and build its resilience against future crises. Thank you and good evening. Continuing on now, uh, we'll focus a little bit more on the property sector in particular. Um, and with us today, we have the CEO of Prime Philippines, who I'm sure many of us already know. It's Mr. Jetson Yu. Jetson Yu is the company's millennial CEO, whose personal mission was to challenge tradition and to create better real estate solutions. Mr. Yu raised Prime Philippines from the ground up and within only eight years from its inception, is now positioned as part of the top five local brokerage firms in the, in the country with a portfolio of over 600 million and 4,000 clients excellently served, spanning across 10 countries worldwide. Mr. Yu is here today to give, us, um, to give his and the company's outlook on the property sector. So without further ado, I introduce Mr. Jetson Yu. I uh, just want to briefly, you know, revisit our predictions for 2020. Prior to the pandemic, we did our predictions and supposedly the office, retail and tourism sectors obviously should still be one of the top drivers for Philippine real estate. But of course, uh, this has changed due to the unprecedented crisis. Um, However, during the first quarter of the pre-pandemic, we also forecasted that this will be a year for REIT and digitalization. When the pandemic started in the country, demand for digitalization surged across the country. In one of our latest forecasts for the year 2020, which, was, uh, which we released around April 2020, I shared it with one of my interviews with uh, AXC, we are going to enter the buyer's market. And that is currently our situation here in Manila. As demand shift towards Greater Metro Manila because of the decentralization push. This is based on a buy-sell scatter concentration model that we have uh, conducted during the first few months of the lockdown. So, Going on to our top five forecasts for year 2021, the year of decentralization, uh, the top one is the year of decentralization. Offices to retain headquarters while branching out operations in key cities. Employees will continue to stay in their home provinces and prefer to work near home or work from home, furthering this is also connected to the hub and spoke model that we have been talking about over the last series of webinars. The growing internet connectivities across the country will also help make 
this hub and spoke model possible. So we have we have um, we have named uh, a few key cities and key provinces that are emerging at least starting within this third quarter and fourth quarter of this year. Uh, these cities are uh, Metro Cebu, Metro Davao, Clark Pampanga, Tarlac, Iloilo, Bacolod, and Cagayan de Oro are among the uh, top emerging cities and provinces at the moment driven by the hub and spoke model given the preference of employees to work near home. So companies are adjusting, BPOs are adjusting, and they're opening up satellite offices to where the employees reside. So moving on to our um, horizontal housing in emerging provinces and cities to sustain demand and sales performance. So 2020 saw a lot of um, purchase volumes for ready for occupancy houses compared to 2019 and out of the 10 developers of housing residential housing developers that we spoke to eight or nine out of ten reported better sales volumes this year compared to 2019 so the public sector initiatives include also their regional level master plan developments which will be strongly complemented by housing Nationwide um, industrial demand will also generate employment in each region with industrial activity providing opportunity for developers. Another thing that we see here is, is that um, there will be an increase in Roland acquisition in select provinces by year 2021. Um, based, on our, uh, based on our talks with several developers, um, most of them are eyeing to put up either township, small township developments, industrial developments, or enter into the horizontal housing development landscape. So the most in-demand sizes are now ranging from about 5 to 100 hectares in selected cities and selected provinces that we have already mentioned. So moving forward, abrupt. There's, there is an abrupt need to adapt in 2020. You know? So the knee-jerk reaction from the lockdowns led to companies clamoring to shift to work-from-home setups. And I guess not all of us here would agree that you know work-from-home setups is really more productive or not because it really depends on the type of work, the nature. Companies that cannot fully work from home are slowly increasing their office utilization and are gradually bringing their employees back to the office. In order to entice employees to work to an office, a work near home is already set up. And this is, as I mentioned earlier, will continuously grow by year 2021. So microsite demand is seen in highly residential areas across the Philippines with good internet infrastructure and good talent pools. Uh, there is a renewed demand in CBDs for the year, coupled with growing demand for satellite offices and business continuity sites, or what we also call recovery centers, as companies now implement risk management strategies. There is also a shift in demand for offices to either flexibility or permanence that we see for 2021. Um, there are only two there are only two, two directions that we are seeing this. Number one is the fully furnished, fully furnished service offices, which offer short-term leases of um, furnished offices, complete with all the uh, air conditioning, all the improvements. And the market for this are companies who don't want to put up a huge capitalization to set up their offices. And as you know, cash is key during crisis, and this is well positioned by year 2021 to start uh, to start the recovery for a lot of service office companies. The second one is the trend that we're looking at is the owning of your own office space. For companies who have the finances, the capacity to buy their own office space, based on our recent talks from some office occupiers who were forced to downsize and pre-terminate some of their spaces due to the pandemic, they are now highly considering to start owning 
their office spaces in the future as they see the investment value of the interior construction improvements. So very interesting for the office sector and um, a lot of things that we are really looking for will, 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 will dramatically shift the way we see the typical leasing, traditional, traditional leasing of office spaces. The industrial sector, on the other hand, will now be in the limelight. It's already happening uh, starting, uh, well, way back 2013, 2014. We talk about industrial sector as the next next major driver for the real estate sector. And I think this pandemic just really brought about that. And uh, the growth of the sector from 2010 to 2019 has left the industrial sector as a secondary investment option for many, but not anymore since industrial sector again is now at the limelight. Over the last couple of months, our industrial transactions have surged to an all-time high, accounting for almost 89.9% of our leasing transactions. Most in-demand areas we have identified here are Laguna, Cavite, Bulacan, Pampanga, Davao, and Cebu. The demand is expected to sustain even well beyond the pandemic because, as you know, logistics, e-commerce activities will continue to drive the sector as the, as the country adapts to digitalization. And we don't see this short term. This is going to be medium to long term um, adjustment of the country. Opportunities for the manufacturing sector is also present due to the plus one initiative of global firms. In our last webinar, we had the honor to, to listen to Director General Charito Plaza of Philippine Economic Zone Authority. She revealed their aggressive push for regional development as well, which includes industrial components in eco zones and to promote small township developments with mixed use, um, with mixed use of residential, office, and industrial. Okay, so moving on to the fourth is the retail sector i think uh for the retail sector obviously this is the uh the most hit the most affected during this pandemic and um shopping malls i think for 2021 the way we see it the way we see it no um it will really depend if the pandemic will end or not but assuming it will end post pandemic shopping malls is set for a quick recovery. For 2021, um, most small operators, owners, I know, I have extend, have already extended super generous concessions to their tenants for this 2020. And there are two big questions and issues now. First is how long can mall owners shoulder the financial burden of these concessions? Second, for tenants, can they still sustain their business with the new set of rental rates that landlords are planning to implement by next year? So I believe that malls will always remain part of Filipino culture as evidenced by the slow growing foot traffic in our malls, despite the active COVID cases in the country. When a store announces a big sale, like recently I saw in a, in a social media post, post, Filipinos flock despite the threat of the virus. So I guess um, it's really part of every Filipino that, you know, mall will always be part of our culture. So at least when the pandemic is over, I believe that malls will remain the leisure destination for Filipinos. Demand shift to community format is also expected by year 2021. Despite malls being a staple, the pandemic has given rise to the importance of key strategic locations outside shopping malls that are near the communities. These are strategically, I'm talking about strategically located commercial strips and neighborhood malls located usually just outside the villages, just outside subdivisions or uh, near residential condominium communities. This has prompted various locators to start considering increasing their presence outside malls through smaller space leases in residential areas. Um, the top 
uh, the, our usual top clients, uh, the fast food chains, uh, coffee shops, and so on, all of them have, for 2020, I think about 9 out of 10 of them have put their expansions on hold, and I think that is just necessary and, 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 uh, and uh, expected because of this pandemic. But a lot of them are really considering to implement new set of expansion plans for the year 2021. And it's something that uh, that is really going to be uh, a major driver for next year's real estate movement in the country. So next is, last but not the least, our fifth is prop tech or property technology. Now, this is something I am personally very excited to share with everyone. Across the globe, a survey conducted sometime 2018 to 2019 showed that Philippine real estate businesses or developers are considered among the least likely to adapt in prop tech. However, this is already changing. Developers are much more aware now but it is but they are still wary and highly unfamiliar with the extent of the capability of technology but they are progressing the lockdown brought out interest but understandably has not reached the levels of understanding the current the most latest protect 3.0 capabilities but at least the interest currently is much more focused on protect 2.0 capabilities on the bright side, developers have begun to realize the value and need for property technology in their business and have included it in their strategies moving forward. In a survey um, that we conducted from different property developers and investors, around 87% said that they are heavily considering to utilize PropTech already. This need was driven by the pandemic where the situation brought out the numerous difficulties and inefficiencies experienced by our respondents, landlords, and developers, especially during the lockdown. The integration to PropTech 3.0 is expected in the medium to long term, but in the short term, we will expect that the PropTech 2.0 will be the main adaptation done by developers to stay competitive. So here we just listed the top three um, problems that our landlords and developers wish to address and that is top one is leads generation and sales second is cost reduction of their this referring to their facilities and property management costs and third remote monitoring of their properties so that ends our top five forecast for year 2021 now I don't want to be the only person talking here all the time and that is why um, some key top real estate leaders in the country here tonight which they'll be sharing their video about their fearless forecast. So how can I describe the year 2020? Uh, honestly, I, I'd love to just curse 2020 and describe it with as many uh, words that I can't really say uh, in, in this video. But I, I think, you know, in all honesty, we have to see the silver lining. Uh, 2020 was really a year of learning. It was, uh, it really showed how tough our company was. I think it really showed how uh, agile that we can be and it showed how creative that we can be. So, you know, you have to take the good, you have to take the bad. Uh, there will be cycles in any business and definitely real estate is one of them and i hope that we really saw the lowest of the lowest cycles that we'll ever see uh, in our life year 2020 was definitely interesting and challenging you know the philippines we go to so many crises every year and over the last couple of years we've gone to an asian financial crisis uh, the global credit crunch and I guess it's the first time for everything, you know, now we've gone to a global pandemic and the coronavirus um, crisis. In all those cases, what you've seen is always the resiliency of the Philippine market as companies have been able to pivot and find new ways to become resilient in terms of uh, thriving and surviving in this current environment.
real estate experienced a major contraction in 2020. The property market took a big, big hit due to COVID-19, which resulted to travel restrictions, diminished tourist arrivals, reduced OFW remittances, unemployment, and dim business consumer confidence. Well, 2020 was a year full of challenges, uh, to say the least. But it also led uh, many companies to look at opportunities and uh, do certain innovations no, on how they do things. And they are able also to adapt to the ever-changing uh, landscape uh, due to the pandemic. The year 2020 was both challenging and a wake-up call. While we started the year in the hope of another banner year, the COVID-19 pandemic caused economic turmoil that our nation had not seen in many decades. We have learned a lot this year. RLC recognizes the need to evolve our business, to hasten our digitalization process, and to move agile at every turn so we can continue to serve our clients and residents without disruption in the new normal. 2020 has also affirmed that cash is really king, so it became every business responsibility to come out with payment terms and assistance for our clients. This year has also been the great equalizer. For this year, we fast-tracked the slow demise of traditional selling into digital selling. The year 2020 was an opportunity for us to rethink the way we do things. This pandemic has been a pause rather than a full stop. And we have taken this time to fix what doesn't work in this new normal and retain and enhance what does work. It's been very challenging but there have been many opportunities that have come along the way. Twenty twenty one will be a year of hope and rebuilding. It will be a promising year where we will be rising up to the challenge of rebuilding what we have lost this year. For many, this year will no longer be just about surviving, but rebuilding businesses to successfully combine control and agility, to pivot from the hits of the 2020 and to redefine our role and brand in this industry. For 2021, RLC will definitely be having an exciting year because we will launch our new brand with Digital Focus. As we always recognize that our customers are the heart of our business, under the new normal, we are ensuring that our services and systems are highly adaptable to keep our clients' safety, security, and comfort from the moment they approach us up to the time they build a new life in our development. Now, going to 2021, I, I, look, that, I look at that with, uh, as a year full of hope. Uh, and, and there is a lot of... Uh, uh, rebound, recovery, and 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 now the the call for for growth. Uh, there are uh, uh, a lot of optimism, uh, uh, considering the news about the cure coming in, and that uh, the distribution channels of this vaccine will already be going out. While we expect the property sector to have a rebound in 2021, the upswing can only be determined on when will the countries be open and that is dependent on the timeline of the distribution of the vaccines. For ISOC Land, we will continue to offer flexible payment terms to our buyers so that we can support the residential business as interest rates remain low. 2021 will be the start of the recovery of the economy of not just the Philippines real estate but all industries in particular. Obviously, everybody's waiting for the vaccine to come to the Philippines. But when that goes underway, you can see a lot more confidence, not just in deals, but everything from eating out to watching movies to traveling. And we will start to see this have a major effect 
in terms of the number of uh, deal flow and the activity in the real estate market? For next year, for 2021, I would say, you know, we'll, we'll probably start to see a, a lot of recovery um, across certain sectors. Some will be recovering faster than others. But I, I think next year, honestly, will still be a bit of survival of the fittest. I think there will still be a lot of uh, businesses that will have a tough time depending on what your business model is. So it, it'll still be a little bit more of uh, what we had to do in 2020, but hopefully with a lot more recovery. 2021 will be a year of recovery and growth. Demand for real estate will bounce back. With schools reopening, and the housing backlog remaining high. The reopening of the economy has re-injected confidence in the market. For us in Torre Lorenzo, we will move ahead with our plans, whether they be medium or long-term. I'm definitely bullish and confident about the future of Philippine real estate. Looking at our demographic factors, you know, our young population, our growing population, all the infrastructure being built in the Philippines, it's clear to see why there's so much potential. And even as right now, we haven't stopped building um, from our development pipeline of 300,000 square meters of commercial space and 100,000 square meters of residential space. All of that is still ongoing. We're also seeing that there's a huge potential right now to diversify. Um, into other geographical location. There's a number of quality and quantifiable assets that are in prime locations that you wouldn't otherwise see right now that have come out of the market. And we're seeing more reasonable prices. So if you have the appetite to expand right now, I think now is definitely a good time to basically um, notch up on your future land bank. The future of real estate is digital. This pandemic has accelerated Torre Lorenzo's digital transformation. And we have adapted to ensure that we provide the most seamless experience possible to our clients. I'm very glad to see the future of real estate to be promising. No doubt, the real estate will be one of the industries that will have the opportunity to thrive in the post-pandemic period. Our homes will have been redefined to a whole new level. It should be built to have spaces that allow coexistence for both work and play, accessibility and security, comfort and productivity, and simplicity and variety. We believe Filipinos will continue to invest more in owning a home that is more akin to their lifestyle. The market will remain high as housing is a fundamental need. However, people will have to take advantage of unique price points and low interest rates. This can only be a promising indicator for our real estate business. We are stronger and soon stabilized amid these challenging times. The future of real estate might be uncertain, but we're very hopeful that the fact that this sector has always been resilient and has always bounced back during past crises. Uh, I, th I think the future of real estate is actually quite interesting. I, I think it's quite promising. And the companies that show that they are agile, they're nimble, they can make decisions very quickly and they can adjust uh, at a moment's notice. I think those are the, the companies that will come out um, successful um, in the future. But I, I, like I said, it's, uh, it's going to be an interesting future. There are so many uh, concepts that uh, people are, you know, putting in place because of this whole pandemic. I, I, I think even without the pandemic, it's uh, it would it, it would be great to see. Uh, it would have been great to see people getting into health uh, and and wellness and designing buildings and houses and other types of structures uh, for this uh, kind of concept. So we we want to see more of that. Uh, we think it's something that that's here to stay. Um, work from home is, I don't think it's going to be a predominant um, setup moving forward. I think there will be a, a, a combination of working from home and, and working from the office. But at the end of the day, I think it's all going to be about flexibility. So I, I, I do look forward to 2021 and uh, the years ahead. Hopefully we've 
um, conquer the worst. And with that, uh, happy holidays to all of you. Opportunities for real estate is uh, limitless. No? Uh, it's it's bound, boundless. We know that uh, uh, real estate is going to be a, a major force. It's going to continue to be uh, uh, a real uh, link for uh, society to grow. That's why I am happy, happy to be in this industry. Uh, where I feel that uh, I could put some value added and, and, and be able to contribute. And that real estate definitely is here to create that impact and that impact will, will, will continue to be there for society and, and generally for business. So, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to one and all. Insights and forecasts there from some of the top stakeholders within our industry. So, 2020 really was a challenging year for us all, especially after many years of smooth sailing for the real estate industry. However, our stakeholders have taken this time to re-strategize and innovate ready for the future. 2020 has also served as a reminder that business will not always be easy and that we have to push through these tough times and be ready to make 2021 a more prosperous year. Overall, we hope everyone here today was able to see where our sector is going moving forward and gathered insights that each of us can use as we continue in our real estate activity. That about wraps up our event for tonight. Thank you to our esteemed speakers for sharing your insights on such a timely and relevant topic. We appreciate the presence, of course, of our audience staying with, with us throughout the event. And we hope to see everyone again in the future events organized by Prime Philippines. For myself and everyone here, I wish you a pleasant rest of the week and a very restful and happy holiday season. Thank you and good night.